And how's everyone doing? Good. Is this on? I'm assuming it is. I won't need to talk too loudly, right? Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Amy Koning. I'm the Associate Dean for the School of Workforce Development and the Business Department, who has so kindly sponsored this competition, is underneath the Workforce Development. So that's kind of where I come into play here. Um, I want to welcome you to the second annual GRCC um, pitch competition. I know you probably all know this as participants, but I just want to let the rest of the world know this, all right? There were 89 entries this year in our second annual idea pitch. Um, the top 15 are sitting in front of us and will actually pitch this evening. So kudos to you. We're just going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> this competition is actually brought about to promote the spirit of entrepreneurship in Western Michigan. And the whole idea behind this came from a group that I affectionately call the WIMCUG group, but that is actually just an acronym. It stands for West Michigan Colleges and Universities Group, of which GRCC is a part. And really what we do um, in collaboration with our other colleges and universities in this area is we conduct these competitions in hopes to foster the entrepreneur and innovative spirit in Western Michigan. That's the whole purpose of that group getting together. Okay, so we have this in the fall, um, the idea pitch competition, and then in the spring we have the business competition, excuse me, business plan competition. Um, so that's just two of the efforts that um, the, the WIMCUG group actually uh, helps to sponsor. You're probably aware that there will be three winners out of this evening, and yes, there's cash involved. Otherwise, you wouldn't all be sitting here, right? I figured as much. So cash, first place is going to receive $800. Second place will receive $300. And third place will receive $100. The top two finalists from GRCC will then advance to what WIMCOG affectionately calls the regional idea pitch. So two from each school, from Davenport, Hope, Kelvin, I gotta get these all, Grand Valley, Aquinas, and Cornerstone, two students who have won their individual school competitions will then advance to the regional pitch competition, where the stakes get a little higher, by the way. The money gets a little bit more, so keep that in mind. Um, that will be held at Davenport this year. Last year, uh, GRCC held it, um, but this year we kind of rotate around at our colleges, and Davenport will be hosting that regional pitch competition for us on November 3rd. Um, it begins at 6 o'clock. So I hope even if you, know, you don't advance, you go and you support GRCC, that's for sure. I want to give a couple of thanks um, before I turn it over here. First of all, obvious thanks to the West Michigan Colleges and Universities Group for even coming up with this idea in the first place. Uh, I don't see any representatives besides myself here in the audience, but I just wanted to publicly uh, acknowledge them as well. Um, the GRCC Business Department, who not only supports these efforts um, financially, but also obviously I think a lot of the students sitting in front of us, uh, from the looks of it, Felix knew a lot of them, so uh, from the looks of it are coming from our business department. But keep in mind that this is not just a business department competition. It's really cross college, because quite frankly I could have a construction trade student that wants to open up their own business and have an idea pitch. I could have a culinary student that wants to open up their own business or they have a great idea and they could um, participate in the idea pitch. So spread the word on that. We're hoping maybe next year we could get into three digits. What do you think, Felix? That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Um, I've referenced Felix a little bit here, and I just want to give a huge thanks to Felix Piero. He is our business department professor. Um, he coordinates all of this. Everything that you see going on here um, has been coordinated through him and his um, student group, which I'm actually going to let him say a little bit more about because I want them all to get um, the correct um, kudos to them as well. So welcome to GRCC if this is your first time. I wish all of you luck um, and good pitches, and I look forward to the outcome tonight. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Professor Felix Pereiro. I'd like to start off uh, by addressing the Entrepreneurial Growth Organization. 
uh, appropriately titled Ego. Uh, let me say that uh, the Entrepreneurial Growth Organization is uh, dedicated to promoting entrepreneurship and self-employment, and it's only in its second year of existence that has already been named at Grand Rapids Community College the most exciting and best student organization group. So please give a round of applause to them for helping me host this event. They are, they are fantastic. Uh, one of the things that helped us win that award at Entrepreneurial Growth Organization was that we did a lot of work for a full year with inner city at-risk high school youth and uh, promoting college and self-employment. And I know that college prepares us to take a job, but here at Grand Rapids Community College, we know in these economic times, it also prepares us to make a job. And so we're very excited about helping all the students across uh, all the different areas that we have here and to promote entrepreneurship and self-employment. Uh, the judges, this year, uh, last year I thought that, that you couldn't get any better with the judges. We had uh, you know, two vice presidents from Amway uh, that were retired that were incredible and also uh, one from General Electric and we thank them for their support. They're on our advisory council and helping us still. This year, all three judges belong to an exciting organization and I hope that some of you check it out and get to meet them and that's the Grand Rapids Inventors Network. Uh, the Grand Rapids Inventors Network meets every month. They do product review pitches and these people are well networked, many of them owning their own manufacturing, their own professional service and if anybody could help you get your idea to manufacturing or get a patent, uh, especially a patent today, right, because we have two pros at that, uh, it's, it's them. It's Grand Rapids Inventors Network, and we're so proud that they've partnered with us. Uh, both uh, Bonnie and Dan uh, were in my Innovation Speaker Series uh, last year, and they did an incredible job, and the students voted that uh, particular uh, speaker series as the very best. And uh, I thank uh, all of them for doing that. So let me start off with Bonnie Noft, uh, Intrepid Plastics. Uh, I can't say enough about Bonnie. She's won just about every award uh, that you could imagine. And uh, she is the president and owner and founder of Intrepid Plastics. Let's give a big round of applause for Bonnie Knopf. Uh, to Bonnie's left, Mike Suman. Uh, Michael uh, was the vice president at Prince Corporation, senior vice president, I should say, and also senior vice president at Johnson Controls, overseeing their $22 billion automotive industry uh, business. So that's fantastic. Uh, Michael today just recently uh, was awarded his 50th patent and uh, also he has written a book and he was just uh, showing it to me and my students were excited. We might have to use that in our entrepreneurship class, there's no doubt about that. Uh, so Michael brings a wealth of experience. So a warm welcome for Michael Suman, please. Uh, Dan Girdwood, uh, he is just amazing. Uh, he is a CPA. Uh, an engineer for a long time, then went to law school, and he works at the prestigious Price Henneveld. They are the nation's leading intellectual property attorneys, and we're so blessed to have so many great companies here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they're based here, and uh, they've helped a lot of the students. Uh, one of the things about Dan, he's just fascinating to, to uh, speak with, and he was part of our speaker series and spoke on intellectual property, but he views it uh, as an entrepreneur. Uh, and as an engineer, and he views it in so many different ways to help the person understand uh, really what business are you in, and to take your idea from concept uh, all the way to market, uh, so it's just beyond uh, the, the legal uh, professional that he is. He helps us so much, and he, he helped us understand patents uh, like nobody before. And I also want to thank Dan because I know that I've used uh, Price Hennefeld in the past with my own company, and uh, I must say that last time Dan spoke, I asked him so many questions, I totaled it up, it would have cost me about $5,000. <laughs> and uh, so he gave our students about $5,000 of free advice. So again, Dan Girdwood, give a round of applause for him, please, as well. What is an what is a idea pitch? Uh, our students that are going to uh, participate today are given 90 seconds to tell you about their idea that they're very passionate about. An idea pitch is also known as an elevator pitch. Uh, think about it this way. You, you have a great idea, you want to share it with the world, and you find yourself in the elevator with somebody very important. Uh, it could be the President of the United States, uh, and he asks you, what do you do? It could be Donald Trump, it could be Oprah Winfrey, uh, it could be Bill Gates and Melinda Gates just happen to be on the elevator with you. 
and it's an exciting moment for you while the elevator goes up to the floor that they're going to get off on, 90 seconds to tell you know, their idea to you. And at the end, we want them to say, tell me more. Uh, please come back with me, join me, or please make an appointment with our assistant because I'd like to help you. Uh, that help could come in the form of uh, investor dollars as an angel investor or a venture capitalist. It could come as a network, a person who could mentor and connect you with the right people to show you how to create a prototype, uh, to show you how to manufacture here in this great country of the United States. And so uh, that's what an elevator pitch is. It's really simple, 90, 90 seconds, and then they ask you questions for three minutes, and that's what the judges will have. It'll be a limit. And then uh, we'll give a round of applause to each of the students that are participating today, and then our next student will come up. And we have 15 different ideas, uh, quite a diverse group. Uh, 15 diverse ideas today. I want to mention to you that Grand Rapids Community College truly believes in entrepreneurship and self-employment, especially in these times. And we'd like to thank all of our community partners for helping students realize their dreams. And it's in that spirit that we come to work excited every day. We're very passionate across here, uh, across the board at Grand Rapids Community College, whether faculty or staff, uh, to help ensure our future leaders. And so no matter what your age or background, uh, no matter where you come from, uh, we're very open-minded and we want to really help you. Uh, today it takes a lot of courage to get up in front of the audience today. And uh, that's a characteristic of all the student presenters today, that they're going to be very courageous to share their ideas. Ideas will be in various stages of development. Some will be more uh, well-researched than others. But make no mistake, it takes a lot of courage uh, to get up in front. Uh, and I talked to many of them today. They're a little bit nervous, especially after seeing the three great judges we have. Uh, but let me assure you that they are already winners. Just by showing up today with a plan to present, you've already won. The money quickly goes. Now, we always take the money, but the money quickly goes. It is the experiences of the people we meet throughout our lives that help one another, that help each other in truly a collaborative effort and not just always a competitive effort. And so, again, I welcome you to the second annual Idea Pitch Competition at the great Grand Rapids Community College. So, without further ado, we're going to uh, get started today. Once I, uh, I'm going to introduce our very first um, uh, contestant, uh, and that is going to be Rebecca Young. And I'd like Rebecca to come. I'm going to ask the other participants if you would please exit the auditorium uh, so as not to give unfair advantage to any uh, uh, competitor this year, we are asking that uh, when Rebecca's done, then we'll bring up our next competitor. I will ask uh, also all of you to make sure, here's the microphone, to please use the microphone, right? You could stand behind here or you could take it off and you, if you want to get closer to the judges, you could do that as well. Uh, with our very first one, uh, very first presentation here, our very first pitch, uh, please, a warm round of applause for the idea, throw out the manual, Rebecca Young. Imagine that you just brought home a new futon. You get all the pieces out, and with those pieces is a manual on how to set up your futon. As you thumb through the manual, you uh, read all the directions, but you realize that they're all in French. Now, this makes it a little bit harder to set up your futon. Um, the only thing that might help you in this scenario is this, the diagrams that are at the top of the page. This for me was not just uh, make-believe, it actually happened. Um, it took me and several others almost two hours to set up four pieces of futon. <laughs> During this long setup, it dawned on me and others that almost everything comes in an application form for smartphones. According to Nielsen.com, one in two Americans have a smartphone by Christmas 2011. After some research for some smartphone applications, there were alternatives um, for traditional directions and manuals, but none like this. The idea was created, and we like to call it Throw Out the Manual. The Throw Out the Manual team includes two computer professionals and, and me. We came up with the idea for Throw Out the Manual, and the customer experience we created is as follows. After buying a piece of ready-to-assemble furniture, the customer will take it home, and after downloading the app, the customer can scan the barcode on the outside of the box, and it will offer several avenues for the customer to choose from. These avenues include standard directions, how-to videos, step-by-step -step instructions, and we also will offer them in many different languages for all, um, to accommodate every customer. 
We believe at, that throw up. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. We believe that throw out the manual was an innovation that will benefit consumers and um, business professionals alike. Thank you. Good job. It's uh, one of the key ways of innovation is to pick a problem and solve it. Sounds like you've done that. Sounds like you're passionate about it, yes. which is fun. Um, took you a while to get into it, to kind of hook me into it. Maybe uh, work on the first statement to try to hook, get, get me into the, the problem somehow. I agree. I, I love the concept. I think it's a great concept. I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more of the scope. I mean, you talked about futon, which is great, but there's so many other things. Maybe touch on a few other ideas as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the idea is a, a great idea. I agree. I like the idea. I haven't heard of it any place else before. And uh, the mediums that you could download, you know, whether it be video or printed and multi-language, I would think could even save some money from printing for some of the manufacturers. And um, yeah. I agree with Dan. You could have, I, I think if you'd have got into the, the problem solution part of the thing uh, quicker, it would have been better. But good job. Oh, thank you. Are there some questions that you might have? Do you have some uh, thoughts on specifically what the app would look like on the phone, how it would uh, uh, be findable cost, how you develop it? Um, we would go to a furniture manufacturer, whether it was ready to assemble bookcases or um, the the idea would be to, we want to hit Ikea. We th figure they're the big whale in the sea to, if we get them, we get all the other furniture companies. But we would set up the video for them. We would help them put the diagrams on our app. Um, we'd also have a search function. So if they didn't have a scan for your barcode, um, they could search the company and then look throughout their furniture um, furniture furniture directory so it'd be a little bit easier for consumers to find it and even if people don't have a smartphone they can find it online so it, we have a, uh, a logo but I wasn't allowed to bring it <laughs> have you talked with any because uh, there's a lot of furniture manufacturing locally have you talked to anybody about that just to see um, kind of what kind of costs would be involved with um, each specific company doing that video piece for each of their products? Um, not yet. This is the uh, first time I've revealed it to public people, um, as well as the two other um, computer professionals. They're just working on the, the ground level right now. Do you have any pro, uh, working prototypes mocked up or faked or any at any level? Um, not yet, no. Um, we would like to within a year. Um, this came about about six months ago. So the, other, the other thing is, is that um, one thing when a, any manufacturer, furniture or otherwise, once they print the manual, one of the problems they have is it's out there forever. And if it's like a year cycle, mm -hmm. you know, work in process, they don't get to change that. And <clears throat> I know a lot of automotive people in cars are having chips that can download new data, you know, like an engine software, um, oxygen sensor information or something like that for the life of the car. So that you could offer that. Oh, okay. Great. One, one other thing is it's important to line up a team to help you. Find somebody who's done it, been there, come close, direction to help so you're not making the same mistakes and, and uh, uh, really will help jump you forward and, and bring the product forward much sooner and more quickly Great. and at lower cost. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, big round of applause for Rebecca Young. Every business starts with an idea, and we're going to get 14 more ideas. There, our very next presenter, uh, Joe, why don't you come on down? Uh, Joe Woodruff is going to present his idea, and the title is Home Saver. Did you leave the iron on? Did you forget to turn the stove off? Did your daughter forget to put her curling iron off before she left the house? These are questions that people think of every day and they struggle with. Hi, I'm Joe Woodruff. And I was wondering if you wish there was something that could give you a peace of mind to know that your family, your pets, and your house is safe. Well, there is, with my idea called the Home Saver. Now, the Home Saver is a device that connects to, you, connects to your circuit breaker and it, can, it alerts you via your uh, phone application. Now the Home Saver you, uh, notices unusual electrical spikes um, 
when there is more electrical usage in your house. And immediately alerts the homeowner via application. Now, the app will tell, it alert the homeowner and it will give the homeowner an option to shut down the power of that region of the house. Now, if the user doesn't respond within three minutes, then the home saver will shut off or will trip the breaker. Why is the home saver important? Okay. The US, in the US, electrical fires are the number one reason for home fires. 49,000 home fires are because of electrical appliances or wiring problems. As a tragic result from these home fires, they claim the lives of hundreds of people and over $670 million in property losses. Keep peace of mind. Keep your family, your pets, and your home safe with Home Saver. Thank you. I love it. Are you taking investors? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> <clears throat> Awesome. Again, uh, great, great introduction and, and uh, focusing on the problem at hand. That's awesome. Get Hook somebody in why they care. What, what difference does it make? Um, supported by some detail. You've, you've appeared to have done your homework and researched the area. Um, sounds like it's uh, certainly possible and needed. Um, do you, have you started building a team to be able to implement this, figure it out? Where do, where do you stand in the development? don't have a prototype as of now. Um, I do know the technologies out there. Um, I do have some connections with consumer energy. I have a couple of friends, parents that have worked there for years. Um, and I know that um, the technology is out there for them, but as a, as a home user, it's not, which is something that should we should be developing into and to give an option for home users to have. So I really liked how you focused on the safety aspect, you know, throwing the family, the dog, the pet bird, you know, all that because it tugs at somebody's heartstring. I guess I'd be more interested to learn a little bit more about the how it works because, you know, some things are, are just kind of conceptual. And you said there's things out there that work already um, in consumers' energy type of thing. But what about how, how would it work for the home? Well, if you look at your... A, a normal home's electrical box. Is it digital at all? No, There's you have, you have flipped the switches. With this, um, it would have a, um, the, the device would connect into the electrical surge to it connects to the rest of the house. Um, there is a device out there right now for the home that Black & Decker sells that monitors minute by minute um, energy usage in your house. Okay, that's a step up for home users. So I went off with that and just said, hey, what about you know all these home fires? Does that prevent it just because it's usage? No, we need something like that. And as you said, what's the technicalities of it work? Well, that hasn't been worked out exactly different, but I, but, you know, like I can't go on with it exactly how it happens right now, but the tech, I have been told the technology is there to make that happen. Um, so is your product something that would monitor the personality of current use in a house and then there were when and set an average sort of for that home and then when there was current draw outside that normal boundary it would go into notice notification mode exactly uh, what i would it would basically uh, monitor for about a month obviously there's always that risk of something going on in that month we know this but i think within that month monitoring the electric usage that happens in your house on a daily basis. Now with that point, okay, what if you're at home, you have something in the crock pot for you know, 12 hours? Okay, well, you're at home. There should be a setting that, okay, I'm home, everything's safe, but also keeping in mind, home fires happen when you're sleeping as well. Will it work in reverse so you could turn things on? Yes. We're done? Yes. One more question. There's an, there's an app I saw on controlling your house lights, turning on a furnace, whatever, or turning on lights, whatever. It seems like you ought to partner up with them. They're already there. They already got the marketing distribution. If there's a way that you could find that company and work with them, you're there. Right. Because timing of getting it in the market is huge in these apps. Thank you very much. Joe have done a great job. I throw out the manual. 
we were working for an office furniture manufacturer here in town and uh, actually eliminating certain numbers of manual that were repetitive saved millions of dollars. And uh, now Joe has this idea in my mind. I'm always driving away from my home thinking I left something on, uh, but that's a personal problem, so we'll move on from that. Uh, our next presenter, we're going to shift gears a little bit. The title of her idea is Smiles for Hope. Uh, please welcome with applause Allison Braunhausen. My name is Allison, and I'm here to tell you about a charity that my friend Alicia and I have started named Smiles for Hope. The purpose of our charity is to make children with cancer smile. We both work at Spectrum Health and have already had the opportunity to put our action or idea into action. Our charity makes headbands and caps for children with cancer to help them gain self-esteem. Since January, our charity has already created over 450 smiles. We constantly receive feedback on how our headbands and caps have raised the self-esteem of these children. We aren't stopping there though. We are receiving suggestions about how we can create even more smiles, such as mustaches for mischief and smiles for sunglasses. We would like to eventually create smiles in other children's hospitals around the nation and eventually around the world. We believe that even children without cancer will enjoy wearing our caps and headbands. The cost to make the headbands can range from $1 to $5, and we can, event we can sell them in local gift shops to gain initial revenue. <laughs> we are always looking for volunteers and donations, so if you would like to help, please contact me, and we would love to hear from you. Great job. Really hooked it in on some, something that people care about. Um, have some relatives that have cancer, so that's personal. And a great close, really, you know, let's do something. Let's not just nice conversations, so very good job. Thank you. Um, a lot of great one-liners, a lot of great summary statements of what it's all about in the talk, so that's good. And, and frankly, one of the most impressive things to me was you're doing it. Yeah. It's not just a discussion, so that's awesome. Thank you. Um, have you partnered with anybody? Is this still just your... Well, and your friends? it's me and a friend, and mm -hmm. we, we work with the Child Life Services at Spectrum Health, and they have um, given us guidelines to follow in order to, you know, make sure that everything is able to be given to these children with cancer. At this point, we haven't really partnered up with anybody, but we are always looking for people to help us with our idea. So I really love the idea, too. Thank I think you. it's great that you're doing things for kids. And I like that you've got some history, mm -hmm. and you've got um, numbers, and you've got, you know, there's it's actually happening, like Dan said. Um, where, what do you guys sell your product for? Do you sell them in the gift stores? And does any money go back to charity? Do you get charity funding to help you with your costs? Um, I, I just want to hear more about your funding model. Okay. At this point, we believe that we can sell the headbands and caps for about seven to fifteen dollars, depending on the size and what obviously went into them. Um, we have decided about fifty-seven percent of the profits will go back into making more headbands, um, and then also whatever's left, we'll try to eventually hire a staff so that we can create and generate more donations. We have thought about getting churches and schools involved as well, and maybe making a fundraising event or where they take their art classroom and make headbands the whole day and have supervision obviously and have you know one of the founding members of the head or the smiles for hope be there to make sure everything is as needed for them to be used in the hospital I also like the idea I think it's uh, you know it's hard not to like something for kids especially if they uh, need some help um, now that you, how long have you been doing this we started giving them away in January um, what's the one or two biggest lessons you've learned from this that you would maybe do different if you were to start over again? Um, we've learned some great things along the way and probably the thing that is most important to remember is that we can't use anything used. So a lot of people would bring in, oh, I have, you know, these old headbands or, you know, these old flowers that I'd like to donate, but there's strict regulations with what children with cancer can have. So it's very important that we make sure everyone knows that all the, the product donations must be brand new. 
in, in, and, and again, this is a great idea. In order to be long term, you've, you've got to have some way of paying yourself, of, you know, of, of all the salaries and things. Um, what organizations might you partner up with, whether it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of existing organizations. What ones might you partner up with? And in particular, um, is there a mentor or person in those organizations that can really spend time on your board? Do you have an advisory board? That is a great question. At this point, we do not have an advisory board, and there aren't really any people that we mentor from. So there, there's not really anybody that we have looked up to at this point or any other organizations that maybe St. Jude's would be a good place for us to contact and see if they would be interested in helping us grow and helping us with any ideas they have as well, what children with cancer might like. <laughs> that was fantastic. It's also to remind everyone that at Grand Rapids Community College, we're not here just to help businesses uh, for profit, but also to do social good and uh, for nonprofit. And we've worked with many nonprofits, um, and they have a different measurement of how they measure success. And so we're very proud of all of our students that start nonprofits or help with nonprofits. Our next presenter, the idea is titled Point of View Books. Please welcome, with warm applause, Brennan Higgins. Thank you, Felix. In the four Gospels of the Bible, we see four different authors um, telling the story of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his disciples. Two of those authors were major characters within the story themselves, and two of them were not. Um, they each had their own different writing styles, and they each told the same events in a different light, and included some that were not in the other stories. Now, since the first century AD, can you name another book that has had the reader have the option to choose which perspective they'd like to see the story they were told? I can't think of any. And that's where I came up with the idea of point of view books. Point of view books would be a franchise of books similar to choose your own adventure style books. Um, but instead of having the choice of where the character will go in the story, it would allow the reader to choose which perspective of the story, what character they want to see the point from. Um, and so imagine, if you will, what this would do to books. Imagine reading Harry Potter but the majority of it, instead of being from Harry Potter's perspective, maybe Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, or maybe even Voldemort himself, how much different would the book be, and how much different would you feel about the characters in the book if you read from a different perspective? I think that this would work um, for business because it would allow a franchise name that people would know what to expect and would know that the people would be interested in. I think this would also work for authors because I think they would be able to see different ways they can show off different perspectives. Thank you. What a, what a great, interesting, fresh idea. Different, different look at things and a good example. Um, how, how are you going to turn it into a business? Any, any thoughts on how you're going to capture that value? Well. I know that uh, Choose Your Own Adventure style, I did a little research. Uh, he started off in the 1970s with his idea, but it didn't really take off until the 80s and 90s. Um, but the number of sales that he did was uh, around 250 million copies. Now, he was not the only author who did these books. He did a collaboration of them. And if you would just think about any, uh, I'm sure some here have read Choose Your Own Adventure style, just name one author that was participating in that. The idea itself sold. And I think that something like this will. Um, certainly, you'd have to get involved with publishing houses and doing things like that. But I think the idea itself would warrant trying to take advantage of that. I'm still just a little bit um, not sure of exactly. I mean, I, I think I know what you mean. Are you talking about if somebody 
wanted the four uh, first books of the Bible, if you wanted a different perspective, if you were Christian or if you were Buddha, if you were, you know, so you uh, could buy that book based on your predetermined bias? No, I wasn't talking about the Bible. I was using that as an example. Oh, okay. um, what I mean by that is you would take a book, um, any book, a Stephen King book, for example, and maybe you're following one character. For the next chapter, you don't, you're not interested in that character anymore. You want to go see the same events unfold, perhaps, from a different character's perspective. Oh, okay. So it's not you who's changing perspective, but the narrator is choosing. Okay. And you said there's a little history with this already from the, the, um, the guy you were just talking about. T this sounds like a, a major undertaking, like the, because I know um, I've, I've written some books too that are not published, but to change the perspective, if you've got four or five key players, it just sounds like a, a major undertaking from a lot of authors. But you said there's already been some, some success with that? Uh, I think there has been. Um, you could have different authors take on different characters, but I believe that one author could do it if he wanted to. And think just on a children's story basis. Uh, the Three Little Pigs, for instance, there's a different perspective from the wolf's telling. And that was a major success. And so I think it could be done. Actually, I actually saw a CSI TV show where they did that from the victim's perspective of all this activity, or, and, or maybe it wasn't CF, CSI, maybe it was, uh, uh, what's the one where somebody gets lost or something. But at any rate, that's a fascinating idea. It's very interesting, and, and uh, I think it's a great idea. I think it's really cool. Um, if I will. Um, with the invention of the Nook and the Kindle, this could be done way easier. Um, if you thought about it on pure book form, it might be a big book, uh, unless it's a children's story. But in the Nook and Kindle, all it would be is just one click of the button, and you could go. Cool. Nice round of applause. This isn't fantastic. We're always in the classroom talking about Thomas Edison and uh, our recent Thomas Edison of our lifetime that lived with us. Steve Jobs recently passed away. And uh, what a contribution he made in the 50-some short years that he was with us. And what you're noticing today are really the next uh, Edisons and the next uh, jobs that are right here on our planet with us. And we're so excited. Uh, the millennials, uh, 80 million plus strong, are really going to uh, shape uh, the United States like it's never been before. So it's just fantastic. Moving on to our next presenter, uh, please give a warm welcome to, uh, to our next presenter. Uh, her idea, the title is Lap Bat Caitlin Schantz. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin. Okay, so my idea is called the Lap Bat. Um, laptops are a very, very important um, technological device in today's world, as we all know. I'm sure all of us have one here. Um, the reason we use laptops is because it helps make our life easier. It's portable technology. Um, but something that I've been wondering about is how portable is a laptop really when you can't be near an outlet or your laptop dies? You're kind of really out of luck and it's useless. Um, I'm a busy college student and I am sick of cords tangled up. I'm sick of scrambling for an outlet, worrying about where I'm going to sit in the classroom. If I can't sit next to an outlet, I'm out of luck. It's something that, you know, just makes my life a little more stressful. Um, with that being said, the lap bat is my idea. It is a cordless portable charging system for laptops. Um, Pretty much what you will do is, it's very easy, you will just charge the battery overnight in the wall as you would do um, a digital camera battery. And um, the next thing, or the next day, you can plug it into your USB drive of your laptop. It conveniently will fit in the USB drive. It's, um, I'm imagining, would be the size of a business card. And um, you have a full day worth of power for your laptop. You don't need to worry about cords. You don't need to worry about finding an outlet. Um, it just will make your life a lot easier and a lot of less stressful. And am I done? Okay. Um, I pretty much just think that this would take the laptop and the portability of a laptop to a whole new level. Yeah. 
I, I want five. <laughs> it's a, a great idea. Do you have any idea how large it would be? The size of a business card is what I'm thinking. Um, it wouldn't really be, it would be pointless if it was too big. So we would want to make it as small and portable and compact as possible, where it would also have the power to last your laptop for a whole day. There are, I believe, some things like that for some cell phones and stuff. Have you researched and seen any of that? I or? haven't seen any of those for cell phones. I did research for laptops, and there's nothing out yet that's a cordless charging device. So I like the size thing, because I guess my question would be, well, why don't you just charge your laptop overnight then? But a lot of times it's it's bulky. It's it's hard to do that. So the size thing is a great concept to just plug into the side if you can get that amount of battery power through it. I guess the one thing that I would ask um, when you start your pitch is to start with a problem. Okay. Because I, I think you said some obvious things, which is good. I mean, we all have laptops, da, da, da. but if start saying, oh, I was taking a test and my laptop died. Has this ever happened? That type of thing. And then it's really going to resonate, I think, with the people listening to a little bit stronger. Thank you. I like the concept also, uh, especially as I think about an emergency kind of backup when I'm on an airplane and my regular battery dies and I could pull this thing out and plug it in. I really like the concept of a USB port because your battery could be NICAD or any other format as long as there was a converter there to give it you know, whatever laptop battery or, you know, the format that the, your laptop took. Um, any idea of what you think would be affordable? Have you ever done any research on costs and market? Um, I haven't. If um, I would like to see this product be like nineteen ninety nine, be definitely below $20. I think that that is something that most of us can afford. Um, cell phone chargers right now are around $14, $15. They can go up to 25 I would like this to be um, under 20 Who are you going to partner up with? Who's going who's gonna to help you with this mentor-wise and help you move forward? Who are you going to team up with? Have you given any thought to that? That is a great question, and no, I haven't. I would like to bring this, I would like to advance this idea and try and execute it. I think that every single American would buy one. I, I know that uh, Apple and some of the other computer type, cell phone type industries are always looking for this kind of idea. Maybe get a name or something from the local Apple store and see who at Apple you could talk to and see what the possibilities are. That'd be really interesting. Again, the point is to take advantage of your idea, move it forward without trying to reinvent the entire structure of sales and all the business infrastructure. Should she get protected first? Tough, tough to protect. Tough. Yeah, until you have a technology or a concept or exact how you're going to do it, be, it'd be tough to get a patent. Uh, Michigan is becoming the hotbed for um, electric car battery manufacturing. While you're still a student and you can put together some sort of a, of a prototype brochure, I'll call it, you can go to those companies and say, I understand that you're working on car batteries, but have you thought of this? I'm just a student. I need some help. Is there any way? Blah, blah, blah. Um, you could use your status right now to get some pretty good information because they wouldn't view you as a threat right. uh, You know, more than somebody else that would come in from another company. That's very important what you said. We have a lot of great partnerships with companies in this area and with LG Chem. Uh, that would be fantastic with the technology from the uh, South Koreans along with our contacts with the executive of General Motors. I'm sure that we could uh, help her uh, possibly and get an internship to work on this problem uh, because it definitely is a need in the marketplace. And Bonnie, thank you for giving my student one more excuse for the test, I couldn't finish the test because. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on to our very next idea. Uh, the title of this idea is Fashion Tag. Uh, please welcome Brittany Osterink. Hi, my name is Brittany Ostrink, and uh, I am a fashion merchandising major here at CC. And my idea I want to let you know about today is called Fashion Tag. 
Fashion Tag is an online program to help people organize and put together the clothes they already own. So how it would work is um, it would be either a website or an application for phones or mobile devices. And um, what you would do is you would enter the item number into the program and it would pop up a picture and um, what you do is you could organize those different clothing items um, within the program and there would also be models on the program that you could um, coordinate the clothes together and put together outfits but you would also have all of the clothes that you already own in one area and you um, could view them from wherever you would have internet access or the app with you and um, like I said it could be either an app with a website or just a website or just an application. So. Okay, so I like your concept, but I guess I, what I didn't hear from you is what problem is this solving? Oh, um, it's to help people um, keep their clothes all at their fingertips and without being at their homes and also to help people put things together just without just without seeing them and help people just put outfits together that don't normally just go through their clothes every day kind of thing. I could use this. My wife says I'm color illiterate. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to incorporate color into this to to part of the matching uh, program? And that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, that could that could be. Um, that could be another feature of the program. I haven't thought that far into it. It's mostly just dealing with your clothes and what you think is good, ideally. So it won't exactly teach you a lot. It'll just help you just see what you have. With uh, the onset of QR codes and existing barcodes, um, my guess is, that if not already, you could take you could scan that like we do with our mobile phones, and not only get the the you know, you could get the what the garment is and the color and the size. So if you were out shopping and you were like me, uh, trouble putting out, you know, things together, you could show the picture of what you have at home to the salesperson and say, what do you have that would fit with this? Mm -hmm. uh, might be an idea. Have you prototyped this at all or no. dug into the coding at all? No, I have not. Just an idea. Well, what? It, it, it seems like there's a lot of directions that this could go. What's the second product? What's the second app? Where where further can you take this beyond just uh, the, the specific clothing right now? Um, like you said, we I could do something different with like color matching or even, um, even putting um, different companies into it and it'll help them like promote their products kind of a thing. What companies? Which, who, again, I go back to trying to partner up with somebody, trying to take advantage of the existing distribution and, and uh, manufacturing, all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. who, who could you partner up with that would really want to do this? Um, I guess any kind of big fashion company, if you think of Nordstrom's or something like that, like J.C. JCPenney. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very good. Hey. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That's very important what the judges are sharing with us is the entrepreneur, uh, the sensory acuity of an entrepreneur to look around in the marketplace and to see a need, a problem that they could solve. Uh, so see a need, solve the problem. It's really basic as that. And then with a lot of passion and tenacity is just keep working at the marketplace might offer solutions, but we might be dissatisfied with those current solutions and you have a better way of solving the problem. So I thank the judges for bringing that out. Uh, it's a learning for all for all of our participants. I can't wait. Uh, next, next presenter, all these ideas are so good. The title of his idea is Helmet HUD. Please welcome Matt Huber. Hello, my name is Matt Huber, like you said. Um, my product is a Helmet HUD or um, heads-up display unit. 
Uh, it's built to make uh, riding motorcycles safer and more enjoyable. Uh, the heads-up display system may, um, may show the speed of your motorcycle, your RPMs, and most importantly, your blind spots. By placing cameras on the back of your helmet, one can check the traffic without turning their, their head. This ensures that the rider can keep their eyes on the road and, and head forward. Turning around to check your blind spots um, can be the most dangerous part of riding a motorcycle. With a helmet hood, this decreases the danger of riding a motorcycle and checking your blind spots. Thank you. Kind of, kind of like what they do on cars right now. They put a camera on the backside, exactly. and it's just a smaller with the technology. I believe is there. Have you checked out the technology? And yes, I have a little bit. There's not much out there for it, but like with webcams and how they're getting better definition, and if you know about the GoPros, their little cameras about that big. Um, with all that um, technology coming into play, I really believe that you can actually mount cameras on the back of your helmet. I know there's actually a company that the Grand Angels invested in that was helmet-mounted cameras for yep. soldiers and things. So you've heard of that. And exactly. Good. That, All right. Yep. Okay, so just to clarify a little bit more, so there's going to be a, a heads-up unit display on a motorcycle, so it's on the windshield? Nope, it's actually in your visor. In right your, in your visor. Helmet. Yep, just like a fighter pilot would have or some cars even have it, only it would probably be up top like in your peripherals, so you can always keep your head forward. You never really have to turn around. Does it, like, plug into your motorcycle? How does it know your, like, your speed and that type of thing? Is it just... Um, probably with a chip of some sort, wirelessly connects to your, to your motorcycle. And Is that a feature that's already in a motorcycle, or...? No, it'd probably just be an add-on chip okay. that would come with that helmet. Okay. I like the idea Rod, a lot. I've ridden um, several maybe 100,000 or more miles on a motorcycle. And one of the most dangerous times is, is, is when you turn around and look because nobody's looking forward. Exactly. Um, also, um, I just bought a new Chevy Tahoe, and they use ultrasonic sensors just to check the blind spots, and that shows up in the mirror. And that would be huge also just to know right. that somebody's there. But also I would suggest that you think about putting closure rates in because that's one of the biggest fears I've always had is I'm setting at a stoplight somebody doesn't see me and they come up, you know, that I could get a warning that somebody's approaching, um, which would, I think, technically be easy to do. Um, any prototypes at all or mock-ups or? Not yet, but also, like, the idea that you're talking about is uh, you could even further it and put a camera right in the back of your head, kind of like a rear view mirror in the car, so you could actually see all your traffic behind you. Right. And the cameras that you're talking about, I mean, and, and all the, uh, you know, uh, tablet computers and phones that have cameras, they're like a postage stamp they're not very thick and they're not very big so it wouldn't exactly. be like a big right. camera camera exactly um, so i really like the idea i, I think it's I know, i'm have you patent researched it all not yet i literally just came up with this idea for this competition like at noon today or something <laughs> i actually found out about it at noon today oh okay good well i think mike um gave some good advice earlier the fact that you're a student and there's a lot of this technology coming out right now getting in touch with people like the Harley Davidsons or the Fords, the Magnas that are coming up with that technology that Mike's talking about. Take advantage of it while you're a student. I, I keep returning to uh, what businesses would want to work with you on this and stuff, and, and more specifically, for example, um, I do work for s, &S uh, Cycle, which makes high-performance stuff for Harley Davidson. They'd eat this up. They, they, you know, if, if you want an internship, I mean, you know, you can play this to, to work and, and really get yourself some ins, some, open some doors, uh, have some fun with this, and work on your pet project. This, this could be cool. And when you go to those companies, you don't, you don't have to have a perfect working prototype. You can just have something mocked up and, and kind of just limp. Don't, in fact, don't make your first prototype perfect. You'll go broke trying, and, and you're going to change it 10 times anyway, or 100 times. So I like that thought. Um, even Gentex Corporation in Zealand does a lot. They, may, they grow their own cameras now that they put in mirrors and things. I mean, you don't have to go very far to get some of this technology. And those companies are looking. Big round of applause. I want to make sure I pronounce the last name perfectly. So 
Sometimes you have to turn on the right side of the brain, the left side. I have to turn on my Cuban brain for this, for the accent. Uh, with the title to her idea, Lunch and Learn, please welcome Olga Sedaiva. Good evening, everybody. I would like to ask a question. How many of you remember what did you have for lunch when you were a kid? Probably was the same thing over and over again. Bologna sandwich, peanut butter and jelly, maybe some chips and some crackers. At least that's how I remember my childhood. I would like to stop that. Enough of boring food. Uh, kids' lunches are, making, are getting a makeover. I would like to introduce a new generation of healthy lunches for kids. Lunch and Learn is a series of healthy lunches for kids and interactive packaging. Let's learn, let's eat, let's play. In our modern society, parents are always busy and they hardly have any time to spend with their kids. I'm not even talking about making lunches for them. My idea, Lunch and Learn, would be a great solution for modern families. It's easy, it's fast, and it's healthy. Um, Lunch and Learn offers a variety of different foods like um, salads, healthy salads, different fruit snacks, yogurts, and sandwiches in different shapes, and even um, healthy juices. And interactive packaging will involve kids in an interesting way of learning different things like shapes, colors, numbers, and even languages. It's so much more fun to do it um, while you eat and play rather than sit in class and try to memorize it over and over again. Thank you. Interesting, yeah, mixing numbers and different shape sandwiches and stuff. Um, it, it would, would it basically be uh, you go to Myers and there's 10, 15 different lunches that you prepackaged that you pick from? Uh, would it be uh, several subcomponents that you pick the sandwich, pick the whatever, pick the whatever, and put them together? How it basically would be packed. So you'll have a, uh, it will be like for lunch for kids to take so parents don't have to put it all together. It would already be pre-made, but it will be fresh. So I don't want it to be like dry and uh, they buy like a bunch of big box for the whole month. They buy it once a week probably. for They put it in a fridge. It's in boxes and it has different um, like numbers and games on them so they can remember. And that's how you would go with it. So kind of like a cereal box where the kids sit there and eat the box while they're eating their cereal in the morning, but you can do this while you're away from home right. um, without your parents there. So, yeah, healthy McDonald's. And it'll McDonald's. be more developed. It's not just a game to go through the, like a maze. Yeah. It'll be more like we can do maybe a, lang a different language like Spanish. You would basic words like fruits and vegetables. You can learn those by just eating them and looking at the words right underneath them. What, what age range are you going to target for this? Uh, I was thinking of uh, even starting from kindergarten age, maybe three or four, and up to um, elementary school. Even 10 years old will be, like middle school, still be great because we can uh, make it more complex for them. I like the idea, uh, the idea a lot. I think you got two markets. One is busy parents that forgot to pack the lunch and they just grab it and go. I mean, but that by itself is probably out there, like Lunchables and those kind of things. But the difference is that it's healthy, it's fresh. No, I get Lunch that. And, and I think right. that's a differentiator. And I also think the learning and the interest thing. And, and um, as Bonnie said, we've all sat there as kids and read the back of the cereal box um, in detail. What do you, um, just along Dan's question, are you thinking this would be done in, in, uh, in the grocery store in age groups? Would this be something that would be delivered on Monday through a delivery service? So we know your kids, we know your background, and you get one package on Monday and your whole week is set? Or what do you think? Uh, I would like to try first set it like a um, maybe a region of schools and try it out how the par how the parents would prefer. Maybe they would rather go to the store and pick them up, or we can um, base it on schools. They can uh, have them set for the kids. But I think in the store they can pick it up wherever they want. What kind of games or what do the um, kids want to emphasize? Like what do they want to choose? What would they rather learn? They can I love the concept. I really, really do. I think that um, the fresh aspect is awesome, but I think that's going to be a difficult piece. So make sure you really look into that, even though it's the best. Um, that might increase costs and that type of thing, but I think it's a great way to look at it. Thank you very much.
Hogan mentioned to me that she was nervous coming up here, but I thought, professional, that was pretty good. She should be nervous more often to, to do that. Uh, and also in a world that we live with, globalization, to learn the different languages in a fun and exciting way, we're getting a, such a diversity of ideas. We're so proud of all of our students. The very next student, his idea is high yield home brew. Please welcome Dallas McCulloch. Hello, my name is Dallas McCulloch, and I'm a craft brewer. Uh, a craft brewer, and I want to start a craft brewery. Spent the previous seven years of my life going on tour, um, doing the music thing, taking me places like Germany, Belgium, the UK, West Coast, pretty much everywhere. Experienced a ridiculous amount of amazing beer, but have still found even in Belgium, loving the stuff made here in Michigan, at least as much, and if if it's not even better. Um, so I became a home brewer myself, and then through that have become a gold medal winning through BJCP, which is like the official international organization. I've even had beer of mine on tap at Hopcat, which is a brewery in downtown. And there are so many just amazing brewers out there who uh, want to start breweries but are not able to find potential investors due to their homebrew setups. They're only making five-gallon batches, which is roughly two cases, as opposed to uh, basically my idea is I want to make a much higher-yielding homebrew setup, which I've designed, which would take you know, a little bit of startup money, but it's uh, roughly six times what the current setup is for the st like standard five-gallon homebrew. In which case, if I was doing 12 cases per batch, I could give out, you know, just a, a ridiculous amount of money or a ri ridiculous amount of beer to various people who would be potential investors for the microbrewery that I would like to start. Um, if you look at things like uh, Bell's Brewery, Founders, New Holland, all of them were started by people that were just homebrewers trying to move on, and really just the and, and so much of the homebrew is at least as good as what's being produced on a large scale, which is people are not able to get their name out there as legitimate brewers. And, well, that's pretty good. I'm cool with that. Hey. <laughs> yeah. wait, Whatever. Wait, wait. <laughs> Great idea. I love it. Fun, fun idea. Well, Interesting uh, uh, business. Um, you, you, you mentioned it's tough to get your name out there. There are several microbrewers. How are you going to do that? Any ideas? Like how, how will I... Get your name out there. Well, I mean, I've already won, you know, be, uh, done beer contests for winning, like, BCJP. So I'm a gold medal brewer, and I've had, um, like, my run that I had at Hopcat was three barrels, which is roughly 750 pints, but that's sold out pretty quick. So even when I'm doing 750 pints, you know, it's cool. that That's helping build up something, but... It's, that's under the Hopcat name, as opposed to if I'm making six times a standard homebrew setup out of my own house, then I, th I think w if I'm making that much beer, it's a lot easier to distribute it. In fact, you guys, give me your names and uh, addresses. I'll drop you off some. Yeah, everybody. I don't care. Yeah. I'll know. I mean, it's a crazy amount of beer. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I'll just drop off a forklift. So I, I guess, um, I mean, I've, I've been to Hopcat, love that place. So uh, first of all, I guess, what makes yours so much better? I mean, obviously, it's a taste thing, right? Who is your audience going to be? And I'm curious, you're talking about the startups and how your, your abilities are so small. The cost comes into when you want to make a larger amount. Is there any type of um, incubators for brewers? Because that might be, like, something interesting you can start with. What do you with. mean by incubator? Um, having several small ones in one area. Well, the the amount of labor it takes to produce, let's say, like, like what I'm aiming for is like one full barrel, which is at roughly tw uh, 12 cases per run. It's pretty much the same amount of labor, and the actual material cost is not a whole lot. It just comes down to applying some methods that I've learned from sitting in on brew sessions at, well, the hideout is where I picked up on a lot of things that kind of cut corners, but I mean, going to breweries just all over the world. Um, and I totally forgot your original question. Who's your audience? Oh, the audience. I mean, beer lovers, just in general. I mean, I can do everything ranging from, you know, standard pale ale or something that's pretty accessible. What we call a gateway drug, as far as craft uh, beer goes, as as opposed to like the uh, beer that I had at Hopcat was called Ginger Vitus. It was a ginger ale, which I've never seen produced anywhere in the United States. So, pretty wide range of things within craft beer, but it's a huge growing segment, even. Uh, well, overall alcohol consumption is down about 3% per year. The Michigan craft beer has grown about 
10 to 12 percent every year, and it's not going away. And it's not cutting off from one another. It's taken away from the, the big three, Anheuser-Busch and Miller and Coors. What, uh, did you invent a capacity device or a bigger pot or quicker, um, you know, brewing? Or is there a technology that allows you to make this capacity? Yeah. Um, well, create a, a wort chiller, which is essentially what, when you're transferring uh, the, the uh, unfermented beer, you have to run it through, um, uh, through a chiller to make it so it's not going to be getting contaminated when it goes into the, uh, like, a storage vessel where it's going to have yeast added to it. Fabricated that um, out of, I guess, copper tubing. It's powered by water and gravity. But it's also just cutting some corners as opposed to uh, using a 30-gallon blue drum with a sterile bag in it as opposed to, like, a stainless steel fermenter, which is going to be extremely expensive, you know, and it, the, the yeast doesn't know if it's in something shiny and silver or if it's in a blue barrel. Fantastic. Beer. College students. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. <laughs> Very good. Remember uh, Felix Pereiro, a uh, beer lover number one. All right. Moving on to our very next idea. I think you're really going to like this idea as well. The title of the idea is Diversity Dolls. Please welcome Whitney Potter. Hi everyone, uh, I am Whitney Potter. I would like to talk to you all today about diversity dolls. They are kind of my alternative to Barbie. Um, I feel that the way that Barbie dolls are shaped and the way they look today sends kind of a, a negative message to our young girls. I feel like it says, you know, you're supposed to look like this when we all know that nobody looks like Barbie. Um, if she were a real person, her bust would be 39 inches. She'd have an 18-inch waist and a 33-inch um, hip region, which is just not practical. So my idea is to have um, a doll, diversity dolls, that are A, um, regular, I won't say regular, but I'll say more of an appropriate shape, more of a something you might see um, in the average human being, as well as have dolls that have um, kind of the various ethnicities represented. Um, I feel like Barbie has tried to do some of this, but their faces all look exactly the same. They're all just duplicate versions of the Caucasian Barbie, only with maybe a darker skin tone, which I don't really feel represents um, the ethnicities very well. So that is what I'm proposing to help our young girls realize their potential and um, grow up to be, you know, successful businesswomen, what have you. I love the name. I think it really captures where you're going and what you're trying to do. That's a great, great name. Um, have you investigated what the dolls look like in Japan or Europe or other countries? I hadn't, but that would definitely be something to take into consideration. Um, I've mostly just seen the Barbie dolls and how they their kind their take on the different ethnicities, like the way they do Japanese dolls and things like that. So. I love the idea too. I think it's great because there, I mean, everything is so ego driven today, especially for young girls and that type of thing. So, I mean, there's like the, the American Girl series. You could have the Diversity Doll series. I mean, it would go in line with that very, very well. And, you know, I really think that if a cabbage patch can be so popular, so can a diversity doll. I love the concept. I would, and Dan's been harping on partnering with uh, people a lot throughout this evening that would be a great place to start is somewhere like the American Girl Dolls yeah. and, and that type of thing. That was actually my thought too, thank you. Yeah, and for for um, um, for us guys, do Ken too while you're at it, way so well, we can. Course. I could never hold myself up to Ken's <laughs> standard uh, in scale or anything else. Um, I like the idea also. I, I almost thought that you were talking about a kit that you buy a doll and then you can make it any, um, oh. you know, you kind of like Mr. Potato Head only better. <laughs> um, any thoughts of um, partnering with a, with a designer or helping get some visual things going on this? Have you done any of that at all? A designer Sketching? as far as clothing uh, or look? No, like, or? like the doll itself. Like a, you um, know. I feel like I would want to kind of get in a lot of them and see a, a very, or a varied, you know, 
proportion of ideas just because everybody's idea of what is regular or what is normal is so different I would like to have a very large group of people going into this to design it well you know because I can buy a doll today because I've been around the world a lot based on any ethnicity you can and and so how is your idea idea different than me just going and buying a Japanese doll or a Korean doll or yeah. how, I feel how like, does your oh I feel like it's different because um, this like we're in America and I there we do have obviously Japanese people in America however I feel as though sometimes they may identify differently than somebody who lives in Japan and exists there than maybe a Japanese person growing up in America it's it's interesting because uh, each new line of dolls or whatever tend to have a theme and your theme is that they're all different they're normal they're there's nothing that sticks out that that is specific. Is that, and, and I'm not criticizing the idea, I think it's a great idea, but it's very difficult to implement. Do you have more thoughts about how to implement this, how to, how to come forward with it? Yeah, absolutely I do. Um, I kind of wanted to have like a, how Barbie does like, you know, like a teacher Barbie, but I wanted my dolls to be more um, doctors, teachers, veterinarians, things like that. Kind of also I don't want to have the idea of another thing with dolls, especially for young girls, is that all you have to do is find a prince and get married and all your dreams will come true and that's all you have to do. And that's something I want to stay away from. I want to really impress upon young girls that like, you know, they'll see the Dr. Barbie and they'll see her and think, or the Dr. Diversity doll and they'll think, oh, this is an ethnic girl and she's doing something other than getting married and being a princess for the rest of her life. And I feel like parents will feel a lot more comfortable purchasing these for their dolls knowing that there is a message there and then I'm also hoping that it'll kind of start conversations between parents and children about you know well why mommy why does this doll look different and that would open up a lot of you know room for growth for children and parents too no it's over At Grand Rapids Community College, one of our core principles that we believe is embedded into our DNA here is diversity. Uh, many of the faculty and staff have traveled all over the world, lovely people, incredible cultures. What makes the United States different? I think it's our diversity here. Uh, where anybody, uh, no matter what their background or their race, uh, can pull themselves up from the bootstraps and do anything they want here. We, we have fertile ground here for entrepreneurship and self-employment. So it's just fantastic. The other thing, too, is I want to make you aware of is that the newest statistics that we also have is that over 20% of our student body uh, is uh, minority students. And so the embracement of uh, diversity here is incredible. And we all help each other. And the millennials, uh, too, have the most diversity out of all the generations uh, that we have had here in the United States. All right, moving on to our next uh, presenter uh, with the idea of senior tech. Please welcome Jeffrey Knoll. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have solved an industry issue. Seniors and technology. My idea to solve this issue is called Senior Tech. Senior Tech is a nonprofit organization that recruits tech savvy individuals, students, and professionals to volunteer their time to assist seniors with technology. Seniors will be helped by volunteers in learning about, setting up, and even repairing technology. This nonprofit organization provides opportunities for volunteers to improve their skills, knowledge, and abilities, all for a good cause. These opportunities will help volunteers improve their resume in order to gain a competitive advantage in the job market. This organization will also expand the network of volunteers by connecting them with other tech-savvy individuals, professionals, and organizations. Senior Tech will seek out funding from a variety of sources that are interested in sponsoring a good cause and could gain from this organization by reaching out to an undervalued market. This idea is a winner. It is a win for our customers who get affordable assistance with the ever-changing world of technology. It is a win for our volunteers who are opened up to new and exciting opportunities associated with serving this good cause. And finally, it is a win for our sponsors to tap into this market 
a win, win, win. Interesting. I Thank love you. your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, be, be specific. You're a senior. You're struggling with uh, putting a cell phone app on or something. And this is an organization you call up and say, hey, who can help me put this app on? Or what? What? How Exa does this work? Actually, my plan is right now, there's actually three ways to get assistance. You can get the in-home assistance where you'll have a volunteer come out to your home and walk you through the process. Um, the other part is that you can go to a seminar. We'll have seminars all around the country. If, if we get to that point, we'll have seminars all around the country where seniors can go to to learn more about this technology. And third, you can call. We'll, we plan on having a 24-7 hotline to where we'll walk you through it over the phone. You know, no cost to you. It's going to be you know 1-800 number that you can call, and we'll help you. We'll walk you through it. Okay, so where's your revenue stream, and is this open to uh, Gen X and Gen Y, or just seniors? Um, ideally, to just kind of get the groundwork going, we're going to probably be around 55 and older. That's going to be the market for now. With that said, each generation is going to get older, and technology will become more and more chaotic. Um, with that said, it'll, how do I put this? Um, eventually, we're going to be in that bracket where Technology just isn't going to make sense to us anymore. Long term, maybe we might open it up to more people. Will it be free like I intend to have seniors, the service for them? Maybe not. All depending on how our sponsors are going to go. And the funding for it, um, actually I did list a couple of my speeches, but I did cut that out as well. A um, couple organizations such as AARP would be interested in sponsoring it. Stores such as Best Buy and Walmart. And technology companies such as Apple. Sony and Nintendo. These are companies that could gain from the seniors not spending money at getting assistance from Geek Squad and stuff like that. They can get the free service, be more informed about technology, and then take that money to the stores and purchase this product. I like the idea a lot. I, uh, I know just, uh, you know, my mom calls me, you know, with an answering machine. I mean, it just goes on and on. And and some people ask you a technical question. You almost don't want to give the answer because you know you're going to be on their quick call list if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like the idea a lot. I really think that uh, my sense is there's a way that a nonprofit can do this because um, basically for the big box stores, they have free salespeople in millions of homes mm -hmm. that are going to need to buy stuff from that. Um, have you approached any retailers with this idea? Um, basically, I just have the groundwork, the idea. I'm pitching it today to kind of not only just just being a finalist, I know that this is a good idea in this competition. Um, if I win or not, doesn't really matter. I know that the idea is good. I got the validation from Ego and all the different members in the organization. Um, the next step is to actually figure out, like for her, um, is it going to be available to Generation X, Generation Y? Are we going to charge them a certain set price to have uh, assist them? The biggest thing that I don't want this company becoming is it is a nonprofit organization. I don't want to be the next Geek Squad. Good job. I recently gave a speech uh, to the AARP of uh, Michigan at Steelcase University, and I was wondering, how am I going to address this audience? And the speech was called uh, Turning Your Passion into Action, Growing Entrepreneurship in Michigan. And uh, the audience uh, at the end quickly reminded me that, yes, Mr. Pereiro, you do qualify as an AARP member now. <laughs> so that was a little bit of a reality test. All right, Jeffrey did a very nice job with senior tech. Our next idea, earbuds for the hearing impaired. Please welcome Corey Elspry. do me a favor. The next time that you're walking around town, you're in the gym, you're in the grocery store, maybe you're in the library, take a look around. How many people do you see wearing earbuds? And how many of those people have hearing aids? The answer, zero. Earbuds are absolutely everywhere. They're ubiquitous, except for those that have hearing aids. Um, what the answer is, we don't have one right now, but I have one for you today. 
It is, is it a headphone maybe that, that they should use that is uncomfortable, is not giving the sound quality? Or maybe they should use, without their hearing aids, the earbuds that are on the market right now. They don't provide the sound level that's necessary for them. Neither one of these is the answer. With my product, people ranging in ages from 5 to 75 will now have what I call hear buds. This is a device that will attach to the back of a hearing aid that will transmit sound from a phone, MP3 player, computer, directly back to the hearing aid. It, it will utilize a port that is already in hearing aids today. 90% of Americans have computerized gadgets that utilize earbuds. With one of every 10 American having some sort of hearing loss to a certain degree, this equates to approximately over 28 million possible market users for earbuds. This is the next invention that I will see it become that bring the hearing impaired people into the normal hearing world um, and feel like they belong. Thank you. Interesting idea and a good job of capturing the, the amount of need for it. Thank you. Um, do, do any of the existing hearing aid companies have a product like this? No, they do not. Not in anything that is specifically like this. Why? That was my question. <laughs> they need it. It's very much needed out in the hearing, aid, uh, hearing impaired community. I guess I need a little more clarification on what the problem is. Is it that people with hearing aids are not able to utilize like hands-free devices? The problem is, is when you have a hearing aid, there's a hear an ear mold that actually goes into the he ear canal itself. You're not allowed to put an earbud in there. So they can't utilize the earbuds. They have to use a headphone, which is very uncomfortable and doesn't always give you the sound quality necessary. And sometimes they do use it without their hearing aids, but they may have different levels of hearing loss on each side. So it doesn't give them that right balance that's necessary. Is that technology there that you could attach this to the hearing aid already, or is that something that has to be developed? There are units um, that actually, they call FM systems that they utilize actually in my son's school right now where they attach a small boot to the bottom of the hearing aid. The teacher's voice goes directly to the hearing aid. So I believe the very beginning, the majority of the technology is there. It's just transforming the product a bit. Have you done any patent searching at all? I have not. Um, it's kind of something that's just a, it's a passion of mine. Inspiration was from my son. And I haven't really divulged into it too much until the idea pitch competition came up. And I threw my name in the hat and said, hey, why not? This would be a good thing. It's a good idea and good job presenting. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, uh, the medical industry, uh, whether it's hearing or whatever it is, is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. So, I mean, you're on the, the definite, the timing of your product is, is amazing. But um, getting together with companies that already have similar products would probably be your quickest route mm -hmm. to success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what companies would you partner with? Who, what, who's, who would want this product? Who could you go to that say, yeah, let's go? Well, the, the first thing, because of my son being an inspiration on that, you see lists now that um, schools require certain supplies to come home. One of them is earbuds. My son has to wear headphones, which doesn't really give him the quality of what he needs. So schools, audiologists, um, the Grand Rapids Oral Deaf Program, Shawnee Park that's here in Grand Rapids that services the Oral Deaf Program, those three major right there would would be probably my primary focus to begin with. I have a nephew that has that same kind of problem. And it's, it, it really changes how they learn and their willingness to participate. So a great Definitely. idea. Definitely. Thank you very much. Okay, a couple things. We have uh, two more ideas that will be presented. The uh, next two ideas that will be presented will be a team of students uh, that will be coming up here and presenting the ideas and then also uh, answering Q&A. Uh, just a couple of uh, things that I need to do. Number one, I just want to make sure that we didn't miss uh, Ben Zoust. Is Ben Zoust by chance in the audience? 
Uh, ben uh, had submitted his idea and was selected to be one of the 15 finalists. So if he happens to show up uh, outside, I want to make sure to uh, get him in uh, for the last presentation. But we hope everything is well with Ben. And uh, again, out of the 89 entries, I just wanted to acknowledge that his idea was chosen to be part of the 15. If we can give a round of applause for Ben, please, even though in his absence. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, um, it is an extreme pleasure. Uh, we have somebody here in the audience with us today that I think is a true visionary uh, that I have worked with, uh, and it's taken just great pleasure on the significant things that we have worked on. Uh, the Keller Future Center is something that uh, we've worked on, Liz and I, uh, over the many years. We've worked on social problems, uh, urban farming we've taken on, we've taken on career service, and then most recently this summer, with the help of the Luma Group, a world-renowned design group, we tackled human center design and the transportation issues of West Michigan. And uh, she's also hosting the Innovation Challenge. Uh, she is our Director of Innovation at the college. And uh, I've worked with her for many, many years. And we have also worked on helping inner city youth and uh, seeing that there's a bright future. And I think that the standard of living will be maintained in the United States in the future. Uh, we're not going to give up the leadership role to anyone because in the United States we have entrepreneurs and we have innovators. And uh, as long as we have innovators, the United States will be great. But I do want to acknowledge, if we can give a round of applause, Liz, could you please stand up? Liz McCormick, all the way in the back, our Director of Innovation at the college. For our next idea, the title is Scantree. And there's three uh, students, uh, Vanessa Gore, Matt Stewart, and Larry Figures. Please welcome them. Good evening. I'd just like to start off by saying how many people in the audience uh, is attached to their um, smartphones? How many people like going to live concerts? Well, Scantree is, is going to become the new app that's integrated to where you can download it to your smartphone and attend your, um, your favorite concert via barcode with the purchase of a credit card or debit card. All right, so the way the system would work is you would go online to purchase your ticket using either the credit card or debit card, like Larry said. And then once the transaction is completed, you would get a confirmation barcode, which would be compatible with any smartphone. And then on the day of the event, you would just bring the smartphone with the barcode on it to the venue, and the venue would have a scanner set up, and you would scan it similarly to a fast pass at a pole, excuse me, a toll road or a parking ramp, and then that would be your paperless entry into the event. Uh, we're hoping that we would be able to sell our app uh, for 99 cents to any user who would like it and um, for the scanners that we would have hopefully we would be able to lease them out to venues such as Van Andel or uh, the Palace at Auburn Hills that's how we would make our money once again the advantages with Scantree is paperless it eliminates will call as well as hassles when you in a long line and hating that you're gonna miss the beginning act of your show and future purposes of it I'm I'm seeing it like you said with uh, Sporting events, I can see it working for sporting events as well. You just touch your compatible smartphone, download your tickets, get the barcode, and have at it. That's it. <laughs> so this is for just getting tickets or actually viewing the concert on your phone? It's, it's actually for tickets. You get a barcode confirmation onto your phone just for entry into a venue. And then you just bring your phone with you and away you go. Rock, walk up to the window, barcode on your smartphone, get scanned, straight in. Have you checked out the competition? Are there existing? Actually, at this, at this moment, I don't, I don't believe it's any competition, but I kind of want to pitch it to somebody like Live Nation, who's actually a big promoter that does a lot of concerts. And Is it similar to the, what do they call it, the G-code or the... The QR codes that are out there now, I know you can make uh, like golf reservations from your smart smartphone right to a website type of thing. Is there similar technology out there? Well, just the idea of the barcode, um, we're thinking to just make it more compatible and easier for, for, for customers that want to just 
knock out the uh, anticipation of looking for the tickets. You can just touch the app on your phone, get the, the get the city or state where the show is appearing at, download it, you know, purchase it, get your barcode via email, show up, you in there. Yeah, it, it sounds like a clever idea. In fact, it's so clever, I just can't believe it's not done already someplace. But I haven't, I haven't seen it. But one thing you might want to do is a, is a real deep uh, patent search. As an inventor, um, one of the hardest things for us to do is to uh, research our own idea. It's hard for us to call our own puppy ugly. So you might want to get some people with fresh eyes looking over your shoulders to do your search for you. But clever idea, and it's paperless. It's less expensive. Have you thought about um, how somebody could um, uh, misuse it? You know, where I could just fake it and get I'll, a barcode. I actually thought about the swaps of it, and uh, just the idea of, like, say, the barcode. You get it on your phone, and and the forwarding to where it could be copying and paste, but no, because once you purchase it with your credit card, it matches your email as well as credit card. So you can only get one scan once you appear in the venue, and that's it. One of the toughest things of, of this kind of idea to me is to capture the, the money. Um, as you bring this out, everybody else says, great idea, and they come out with their own version. How do you stop somebody else from, from uh, uh, doing the same thing, developing the own software. And I guess that's a long way of saying, uh, to me, it strikes me as first to market is going to be huge yes. on getting this done. Have you figured, thought about ways of, again, how to get it to market, how to, how to partner up with somebody who's already got the distribution, already got the horsepower, the manpower, the sales, to get her there? To be honest with you, that's a good question. I'm kind of like looking at the, the future of creating a device that actually scans your smartphone and my idea was, if we get that created, just similar to like um, casinos where you, eat, majority of casinos in Las Vegas, they lease their slot machines. I want to lease this this device to all venues that, that, that shows concerts or sporting events to where if somebody wants to piggyback it, it's cool, but we're still going to own the leasing of the device to where you got to get a stand, so we still make money off that. This is fantastic. Uh, sometimes I'm asked, what happened before idea pitch? Well, in our classes, uh, we used to do this all the time. And then people would come and visit us and want to pitch their ideas. And uh, have any gone to market? And the answer is yes. We've had many, many ideas go to marketplace right now, where you're looking at um, Queen Bee's quilt shop on division. You're looking at Justin Williams, who six years ago started with one limo. And today, he is the premier limo and party bus service here in West Michigan. And uh, also, Laura Ewing with House of Prayer, uh, helping uh, women who've gone through drug intervention uh, treatment to assimilate to uh, back to society. And now, we've just opened up our second house to help women that could stay there for three months or up to a year. And we have many, many more examples of our students making uh, their businesses and being self-employed, not only for profit, but for also uh, the goodwill of society uh, through nonprofit. Uh, it's interesting, uh, we had Vanessa Gore just up here in a moment, and we're going to have Daniel Gore. Uh, she's going to come up here. I worked with her father many years ago. I was a consultant to Griner Architects and Engineers, and uh, it's, it, we get the children come through here all the time, and they're so entrepreneurial, they're fantastic. So I can't wait for you to meet uh, both Michael Korn and Daniel Gore, Enterpriser, is the title of their idea. Please welcome them. Good afternoon, judges. Um, in today's economy, the job market is competitive as it has ever been. More students are studying technology in areas such as web design, web development, and graphic design, along with software development. The question is, where do they find the work and the experience after college? Furthermore, business students, such as everyone here that's presented today, uh, have such great ideas, but they stall because they don't have the technical skill to say, program. Um, our group, Enterpriser, 
wants to bridge the gap between the two departments. Uh, we will be providing a website where entrepreneurs can post jobs or roles that need to be fulfilled by students with a technological background. And then these students with the ideas will have these jobs be able to be fulfilled. Um, revenue will be based off of a subscription-based model, and then additional revenue will be based off of pay per post. Uh, the startup cost is low because the technology already exists to implement it, and it's very, very, it's about, say, $100 just to get it up and going. Uh, the value proposition is best value because the posts are going to be $2.99 per post, while subscriptions will be see, $9.99. Uh, we want to be able to collaborate with student employment services, and if we aren't able to, then we are prepared to go at it alone. Uh, it will be advertised and marketed via social media, word of mouth, and person to person being that we'll be able to talk to the department heads of the business department and the computer science department. We will assume no responsibilities to comp uh, for compensation between the two parties and we are simply there to connect ideas with skills. Thank you. Great idea, great need. Thank you. Tough to match them up. You've got a tremendous turnover of students and tough to to measure their skills. Do you have yes. some thoughts on how to do that? Can you say the question one more time, please? Tough to match up students and assess their skills with people that the job opportunities for them. Right. Complicated um, by a bunch of students coming through. Well, it'll be, since it's gonna be run off of a technology called WordPress, which is actually blog software, it's gonna be a plugin that'll allow, basically if you to post anything you want, and it could be based on category. Now, when you go onto the website, you'll be able to see, like, okay, I have experience in iOS development, iPhone, or Android. I will go right there and look for whatever jobs are most available to me and then accept it. So it's just a matter of being sure that that's there. Not only are we going to be at GRC, so we're going to expand to all West Michigan colleges within, I don't know, maybe a year and a half. So it's just a matter of those being there available to students. So you talked about um, some revenue opportunities through posting yes. and subscription. Uh, um, can you tell me the difference between the two? And also, yeah. I want to see if you're targeting HR agencies like a nonprofit HR company, um, human resources that might be in the job market searching for your... Right. Um, with the subscription-based model that I spoke of earlier, you would get a lot more benefits, like unlimited roles within a specific job. With just the post, that for two ninety nine, you're getting just that, the post. Um, for HR agencies, that's not something I have considered just as, as of yet, but as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to talk with student employment services, and right now we're talking with um, the computer science department here at GRCC, so there is some talk of that, yes. State again what problem you're solving. Um, I like to use a story that like last year I presented an idea, and I have a friend of mine who's here in the audience who had an idea where we just couldn't, we didn't have the uh, the client, the talent, to be actually able to develop some of these computer science ideas. So we're com basically bridging the gaps between the business department over here and then the computer science department here in this building. So Danielle, look at how pretty up there. You got to talk a little bit. So um, if I'm a business owner and I want to help, or I want to hire somebody or or utilize your service. How does it work from my perspective? Um, I just want to say, I'm getting over being sick, so that's why I'm kind of standing in the corner here. But So if you'll excuse my raspy throat, if that's how it's coming through on the mic. Um, so when you go onto the website, um, we're going to have a search optimization type thing where you can um, type in keywords, buzzwords, and then the post will come up according to what you're looking for. Or you can just go through and browse um, what kind of projects you're looking to work on or something that you're looking to do. I'm sometimes I'm slow, but I'm still struggling with how do you keep the data good? How do you keep it up to date? How do you take somebody's name off once they get a job? How do you find all the new students coming in with skills? Um, that's all you know based on the whole marketing aspect of it. Since uh, both myself and uh, Jason over here uh, are really into social media, we want to be able to use that to market and be able to talk to the department heads. And since it's run off of a website with the technology that's already implemented, it'll be automated and we'll have someone on the back end making sure that that all goes to plan and that 
things that, okay, that's gone. So there. Cool. Good idea. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic, wasn't it? Can we have a big round of applause for all of our presenters today? A, mo a moment ago, I shared with you the businesses that after an idea pitch have been launched, and there are many. Also, good things happen to the people that participate in our student organizations, especially the Entrepreneurship Growth Organization, as well as the idea pitch competition. Uh, we've had several students get paid internships in prestigious areas. Uh, Jason Schimmel uh, received a prestigious internship uh, where he called on CEOs with Bill Smart as part of the Right Place uh, organization here in town. Courtney DeHaan, uh, because of her work uh, with me on innovation and with Liz on innovation, uh, she received a prestigious appointment of an internship for a year at uh, Steelcase. And so again, I could go on and on. Uh, also, on the process to making uh, a job, sometimes they choose to take a job. Uh, Matt Smith recently uh, interviewed with the uh, part owner and uh, president of a local manufacturer, and today, uh, with his associate's degree, he's making excellent money. I'm not going to share the salary and privacy to him, but I can tell you it's incredible, and he is uh, over 45 people at this organization today, a very young age, and so we prepare them not only to uh, take a job, but also to make a job. And we congratulate Jason and Courtney and Matt and all the other students uh, that have done that. Also a special recognition that Daniel Gore, she wasn't feeling very well today. She is our CEO of the Entrepreneurship Growth Organization as well. And uh, so she, she would love to have spoken a little bit more, I'm sure. Uh, so what are we going to do next? Well, first of all, let me let you know that outside we have uh, some snacks and some food and some drinks. Uh, not homebrew, but uh, we do maybe in the future. Uh, and we would like the audience, if possible, to uh, stay around. Uh, the judges are going to deliberate. It'll take a short amount of time. Uh, they will choose our top three uh, winners today and the two that will then go on to uh, compete at Davenport University against the other six colleges. Uh, all the colleges will choose their top two. We're very, very excited about that. If there's uh, any reporters or press, uh, I would ask that uh, all the... Uh, presenters, if you could please come up front while I leave with the judges. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, you might get an interview or two, and they might be interested in learning more about your particular idea. Uh, the judges and I will be back shortly and announce the winners of the second annual Idea Pitch Competition. So please hang in there and uh, enjoy some drinks and some food on us, uh, and we'll be right back. Is that one on? <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, and thank you so much again for your patience. And uh, I really like decision makers, and the judges were uh, fantastic. It was not an easy decision to uh, go through all 14 ideas and then pick the uh, top three. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is uh, turn it over to um, Dan and uh, Bonnie and Michael, and each of the judges would like to address the participants and the audience. Thanks, this was awesome. You guys are great, and it's fun to see the enthusiasm, and that's part of what this pitch was about. We, we struggled with that. How much do you play on the idea itself versus the pitch? And this is a pitch competition, so I understand it was a very close question. You all did great. Really appreciate being a part. This is cool. I, uh, yeah, we, you know, the forms that we use, you add up uh, sort of digitally all the, you know, we gave like four different things and four different numbers and you add them all up and then they're all the same. You go, well, this isn't going to work, so how are we going to do this? So then we start talking about value of the pitch, value of the idea. Um, I've done a lot of products. I have two or three products going on in my life all the time at all stages of start to finish. And if there's just one uh, note I'd like to give you all when you're doing your ideas and move forward with them. Um, is to prototype the whole business. Don't just work on the product. Work on the packaging, work on the marketing, work on the brochure, work on uh, manufacturing and purchasing and distribution and all those things. Prototype it all. Don't just do the part. And thanks a lot for inviting me. I enjoyed it very much. So one thing I heard uh, mentioned earlier tonight a little bit was uh, networking. 
and you guys have probably heard it all. It's not who or what you know, it's who you know. So make sure you connect. Um, you know, we're part of the Grand Rapids Inventors Network. You guys show up and you see people like Dan and Mike, and they're free. Any, any other time you talk to Dan, he's 250 bucks an hour. So, yeah, he's free at these Inventor Networks. I thought it was 450. Uh, yeah, I don't know the talk. exact number, but. Um, <laughs> These kind of people are available and wanting to help you guys. You got to go to the spots that they are. So check out nonprofits, network as much as you can in the areas that you're interested. If it's a health device, go to health meetings. You know, there's, there's nonprofits for everything. So make sure that you get involved with that because it genuinely is, is not what you know, it's who you know. Um, and this, the last thing I want to mention is make sure when you do your pitch, that you talk about the problem you're solving because you could have the greatest thing. We had a guy that did this hunting thing. It was so cool. It was made out of orange polypropylene and it withstood like 40 degree temperature. Or da -da -da. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. What's the problem you're solving? So talk about the problem. You can be smart later. Talk about what's going to help the person that's got to take the money out of the pocket and buy this. So great job tonight. This is fantastic. Can we get a round of applause for all three judges again? Excellent job. Excellent job. Well, Liz, we are back recruiting the judges, uh, Amy and I. Uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurship uh, work here uh, at the college, and we're all united on the different teams. Uh, Mike Suman is uh, going to start a radio program on innovation with Grand Valley State University, so we're going to be able to link into that. Uh, Bonnie and uh, Michael and Dan have graciously agreed to be part of the Innovation Speaker Series and uh, to uh, come and speak uh, individually. And uh, I like the idea of uh, throwing out a shout out to the Grand Rapids Inventors Network as well as the Muskegon Inventors Network. Uh, thank you to your organizations for supporting entrepreneurship and uh, helping all the people uh, live their dreams here. So can we get a round of applause for the Grand Rapids Inventors Network? Also, there, you know, there has to be a plug. Mike. Mike showed me, uh, you know, and he just autographed this book for me, so I'm going to give him a plug. And Mike is coming out with a book, and I think I'm going to be using it in all the classes. Glenn and I are going to be selecting it. Uh, should your idea become a business, uh, Michael Suman, so I can't wait uh, to read through this and then to, uh, it just, it's the right size and the right price point, I think, for our students. So this is going to be fantastic. Well, the time has come. You've worked very hard. You had a lot of courage to submit your ideas and you're already a winner. Uh, 15 ideas were submitted out of 89, and you made it this far. Now came the hard decisions of who do we send on and who do we award today. But I want to make sure that uh, if you don't get a cash prize today, you understand that we reach out to you and we really admire you and your courage uh, and to uh, be people of goodwill really trying to help uh, us here, our planet and uh, with your ideas. So again, one big round of applause for all of our presenters. Well, the time has come, so we're going to go third place, second place, and then uh, first place. Uh, remember that uh, first and second place winners today will advance to Davenport University on Thursday, November 3rd, and compete against six other colleges. The six other colleges will send their two best and uh, we're going to send ours and hopefully this year amy we're going to be able to win at davenport that'll be fantastic so uh, we're looking forward to that all right uh if when i announce your name if you would please come up and uh, i will give you a big check this is a big check so i'm going to give you a big check and then shake your hands and there'll be some photographs and things going on and we'll pause for a moment and a big round of applause for you and then uh, if you could please stay up here with your big check while i announce sec uh, second and then first place all right Big check. GRCC, for their second annual idea pitch competition, is proud to announce that the third place winner this year is Jeffrey Knoll. Jeffrey Knoll. show you how. All right, great news. 
In second place, again at the second annual GRCC Idea Pitch, we are proud to announce that the second place winner, Olga Seriava. It was very difficult to make a decision, uh, but I tell you what, the judges, when they looked at their score sheets, this, this was uh, something I haven't seen before. Uh, it was as close as unanimous as I could uh, see it. Uh, first place this year at the second annual GRCC Idea Pitch Competition. So we've got 100, 300, here comes a big $800 check. Oh, a big, give a big round of applause because both Olga and this person will be representing us in two weeks at Davenport University, Allison Bronshausen. <laughs> Smiles for hope. I've been your host, Felix Pereiro, Professor Pereiro, on behalf of all of us here at GRCC, both staff and faculty, thank you for staying and enjoying this wonderful moment with us. We hope to see you next year. God